with that uh, avalanche of contradictory uh, attributes and qualities, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, we could all find a home. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, <laughs> I want to thank uh, uh, Neil Baldwin for his uh, very, very kind and generous words. And uh, to say specifically, I'm not sure about the steady cam, but I don't like the handheld camera. So you are certainly on the right track. Uh, uh, um, if I had to choose between the two, you're absolutely right. It would be the steady cam, certainly. Um, I, I. Uh, we only have a little bit of time, uh, and there are several things that I want to do. But I guess I'll start by saying that uh, the new novel, uh, for which I received uh, the National Book Award for Fiction this year, uh, and really uh, a wonderful uh, honor and a great uh, joy to me to, uh, to have received this prize and to have um, my fiction uh, assume what, for me, it, it has always had, which is the central place in, in what I do, though I do do lots of other things as well. Um, I, I, I will uh, read a little bit, start by reading a little bit from In America, which is this novel, the last novel I wrote, and tell you, um, I was just now thinking, well, what should I read from? I, as you will shortly see, I like to read. Uh, and there are a number of parts of the book which I have enjoyed reading aloud to audiences. And uh, then I thought, well, it's, in a way, it's kind of obvious what I might read, uh, since I can only read a couple of pages, because I do want to make a few remarks uh, about the writing life, as I've been invited to do. Uh, I, I thought it would be appropriate to read uh, a couple of pages from uh, uh, chapter which takes place in San Francisco. And to tell you, uh, first of all, for those of you who don't know the book, that it, uh, the principal character is a great actress, uh, Polish, who abandons her career in, in Poland. She is the, the greatest actress in Poland. If think of someone like Sarah Bernhardt. The year, the year, or rather the decade, that's perhaps easier to think of, is the 1870s. Uh, the 1870s. She and a group of friends and bringing her husband and a uh, small child from a previous relationship immigrate to the United States. She's giving up her career and real glory. She's one of the most famous people in her country, national heroine, uh, to uh, come to the new world to change her life. She is involved in a uh, project, use that word again, project of self-transformation. Uh, and she wants to give up the theater. And uh, she and her friends buy land. Uh, it start, the book starts in Poland, and it's about their decision to come and about the trip. And they, they, have they first come to New York and eventually make their way to California. Land is purchased in Southern California um, in a little um, um, vineyard community um, we had about 2,000 people called Anaheim, <laughs> uh, not too far from another small but much larger town of 10,000 people called Los Angeles. Uh, in other words, Southern California was uh, quite underpopulated, not empty, as colonial people always say. There were Native Americans, and of course there were Mexicans, and there were uh, Chinese laborers. Uh, but there were very few European uh, immigrants or descendants of Europeans in uh, Southern California. So, of course, with the usual presumption of people of European origin, one says Southern California was empty at the time. Uh, at the time, San Francisco was anything but empty. San Francisco had over 300,000 people, between three and 400,000 people, making it far and away the biggest uh, city in the United States west of the Mississippi. It had about half the population it has now. It was a major city. It had many theaters. Uh, it was the great metropolis um, in the western part of the United States. Well, eventually, uh, they, they buy this farm. They uh, want to live communally. 
The model is very vaguely a Brook Farm, uh, and uh, eventually it doesn't work. Most of the uh, people go back to Poland. And the, the main character, uh, whose name I uh, give, the, the, the name I give her is Marina, uh, she goes back on stage. She comes up here to San Francisco, and she seeks an audition with a man who is the director of a theater uh, called the California Theater, which was the great theater, probably the second uh, best theater in the whole United States, the, the best being Booth's Theater in New York City. Again, it's the 1870s. Uh, um, and eventually, she does get an audition with this uh, Barton, uh, who is the manager of the stage, or what we would say the artistic director of the theater. There's also an ad administrative uh, director. And word is sent to him that this great Polish actress is in town and wants a, an, an audition. And you know, and you can imagine Barton's response. I mean, that's not described in the novel, but I'm, you know, as I thought of it, as I imagined it. Yeah, 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 yeah. A great Polish actress, right. What's that? What's, what does that mean? Um, but finally, he does, uh, he does give her an audition. And it's that little bit of the beginning of the audition scene, which is in uh, the chapter called Seven. It's actually the eighth chapter, because there's a prologue chapter called Zero. It's the, that that I want to read you. I also have a, a lot of associations with uh, reading this to you because, in fact, as I was thinking about the book and thinking uh, and, and, and thinking about the story, I actually began uh, by doing a little bit of reading in the California Historical Society here in San Francisco. I mean, I. Uh, Doing, doing the reading and, and foraging about for the right kind of historical details in Poland and in Southern California and New York, that actually came later. But um, I ha when I was just first thinking of the book, before I actually started writing it, it was immediately after finishing The Volcano Lover, so I'm talking about the beginning of, of 1993. I happened to be in San Francisco, and I was uh, spending a lot of time with a, a friend here, Stephen Barkley, who who made a, a contact with me with the California Historical Society. And so I was reading San Francisco newspapers from 1877, almost the first bit of what other people call research, but I call reading, uh, which I did to, to get the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of material world and the historical world correct. Anyway, I'll just read you this little bit. Um, it's, uh, the, the novel um, is mostly in the third person, but there are monologue parts. There's one whole chapter that's told in the form of a letter, therefore in the first person. Begins with a monologue, ends with a monologue. It's a monologue by Edwin Booth. Eventually, when she does go back on the stage, she becomes the most famous actress in America, Polish accent and all. Um, and it ends with a, a scene with Edwin Booth, the greatest actor of, of the era, who's younger brother, as everyone knows, of course, had uh, assassinated Lincoln, also an actor, um, John Wilkes Booth. Uh, but that, of course, comes much later in the book. Here, it, it, it just describes how she, before what I'm reading, she seeks an audition uh, with this uh, Barton and tries to figure out what she's going to uh, perform if she gets an audition. And then here is um, Barton's response, Barton's monologue. Now, you mentioned genius, said Angus Barton, although Marina hadn't mentioned it. And genius speaks in every tongue. I'm not saying that isn't true, and I'm not saying I don't believe you weren't some kind of star in your own country, all your compatriots here in San Francisco who've been writing me letters and coming to the theater and imploring me to see you and leaving me articles about you, which of course I can't read. They couldn't be making it all up, could they? But this is America, and you say you want to act in English, even though it makes no sense for a foreign actress to come here and not act in her own language, since our public is used to that and think they do understand as long as they know their, and as long as they know the story. Though I hold to the old-fashioned idea that when it comes to a play, the audience ought to understand the words. And I'm not saying the public in America hasn't opened its arms to foreign actors, but they come from countries that Americans like the sound of, like France and Italy 
and I'm afraid your country isn't one of those. <laughs> and they come here on a tour with everything nicely prepared and everyone eager to see them, and then they go home. And I'm not saying I won't give you an audition, if only to get your friends to stop badgering me, if I'm willing to do that. But you must agree that I can be honest with you. I shall criticize you, frankly. I'm not going to mince my words. Yes, said Marina. And I'm not saying I think it's a complete waste of my time for me to give you an hour on Wednesday morning. Sorry I can't spend any more time with you now. I have an appointment in a few minutes. But I don't want you to get your hopes up. You seem like a nice woman, very dignified, with your mind all made up. I like that. I like a woman with spark, a woman who knows how to stand up for herself. But you have to bend in this country, too. Everyone does. And I'm not saying that you've not heard this before, but theater has to be good business. People here don't go so much for highfalutin ideas of theater, such as they keep on with in Europe. And I'm not saying that you don't know that, but what I see before me here is a lady. And perhaps back in your country, a refined woman like yourself would make a great impression. You can impress the public with that here, too. But they don't want a steady diet of lady. Not even our rich folks in San Francisco, and we have plenty of them now with all the Comstock bullion like the late Mr. Ralston who built this theater in the Palace Hotel too. He liked a lot of fancy European things. And I'm not saying that they're just a bunch of snobs living in the mansions on Knob Hill who all take boxes at the California theater because rich people want to think they have culture. That's why the city has so many theaters, and there are quite a few Jews in society here, and I guess they're the most cultivated, but you can't play only to them. So I'm not saying that San Francisco doesn't have some people who know what they're seeing. When Booth comes and does a turn here, or one of the big stars on tour from Europe comes through, all of them hoping to play at the California, because everyone knows that after Booth's theater in New York, it's the best theater in the country. And that makes our public extra hard to please, especially the newspaper men here who are just waiting to puncture the balloon of some big foreign reputation. And I'm not saying that ordinary people don't go to the theater too, and if you don't please them, it doesn't work at all. They have to cheer and laugh and poke each other in the ribs and cry. I was wondering if you could do comedy roles. No, from the look of you, probably not. Well, that settles it. You'll have to make them cry. <laughs> yes, said Marina. He looked at her sharply. I don't discourage you or disarm you with all this prattle? No. Ah, I see. You are proud. You are confident. You're probably intelligent. Well, he snorted, that's no asset for an actor. I've been told that before, Mr. Barton. I suppose you have. But you could be more condescending. You could have said to me that intelligence is no asset for a woman. Yes, I could have said that. I shall hereby make note not to say it to you. He stared at her with curiosity and irritation. I'll tell you what, madame, I can't pronounce your name. Let's get this over with. Are you prepared to do something right now? Of course she was not. Yes. And we'll part as friends, right? No hard feelings. And it will be my pleasure to invite you to my box any evening this week. I'm not going to waste your time, Mr. Barton. Barton slapped the desk. Charles, Charles! A young man peeped through the door. Go run over to Ames's office and tell him to hold tight. I won't be free for another half hour. And send William to put some lamps on the stage and a table and chair. A chair is enough, said Marina. Forget the table, shouted Barton. And Barton led her from his office through a maze of corridors. As Barton led her from his office through a maze of corridors, he said, and what are you going to do for me? I was thinking of... Juliet, or Marguerite Gautier, or perhaps Adrienne Lecouvreur. These are all roles I have played many times in my native country and have now learned in English. She paused, as if hesitating. I think if you have no objection, I shall show you my Adrienne. That was the role in which I made my debut at the Imperial Theater in Warsaw, and it has always brought me luck. Barton whistled and shook his head. 
Yes, the climax of Act Four, when Adrienne recites to her rival in front of a glittering assembly the insulting tirade from Phaedre, and from that straight into Act Five. Perhaps not all of five, said Barton quickly, and I won't need Phaedre. In any case, Marina continued imperturbably, I shall require the good offices of a young friend who is waiting in the lobby and has my copy of Adrienne with her to join me on the stage to read. We had Ristori in San Francisco with her troupe during, doing that only two years ago, but she was at the Bush. Of course, she did it in Italian. Maybe she did one speech in English. No matter, you couldn't understand a word she said. After she paid for most of her reviews, the public came, and in the end, it was quite a success. Yes, said Marina. I was sure you were familiar with the play. They had reached the wings. Before her was the dim stage, and waiting at the center, a plain wooden chair. A stage. She would be walking again onto a stage. Marina paused for a moment, a moment of genuine hesitation. So overcome was she by excitement and joy, which she supposed Barton would interpret as stage fright. No, not even stage fright, but ordinary panic, the panic of the amateur who, having passed herself off as a professional, is about to be caught out in her deception. Well, he said, here you are. Yes, she said. Here I am. Thank you. Of course, I'd just love to read you the whole scene. And at the end, as you know, he says, my god, you are the greatest actress I ever saw. Can you forgive me? And she says, let's discuss the terms. <laughs> All right, let me just say a few words. I maybe I think the format, if I remember what Neil has told me, is that to have some kind of exchange or question and answer. So I will just say a, a few words about writing. I, I, uh, uh, I, I, to paraphrase something uh, uh, that Oscar Wilde said about art, I, I, when I think about writing, it's a bit the way, the way Neil so generously introduced me. I think that writing is something uh, of, of which could be said uh, that anything you say is true about it, and the opposite of anything you say about it is also true. Uh, but obviously, uh, one does write out of a certain temperament. And I, I find that the word temperament, if I'm asked to explain um, what I do or what kind of choices I I make. I'm I'm much more interested in exploring that idea that there are, are certain certain temperaments which are perhaps more suited to becoming writers. Talent is um, there's a lot of talent around. Talent is not uncommon. What is uncommon is a certain kind of temperament, a certain kind of uh, obsession. Lots of people have talent, uh, especially when they're young, and uh, why some people become writers or artists of different kinds, uh, I think really has much more to do with uh, character uh, than anything else, and with certain kinds of uh, choices that you are impelled to make in, in, in your life. You're, you're, for instance, in the case of being a writer, unlike being an actor, uh, you have to have a high tolerance for solitude because uh, being a writer uh, uh, involves being alone a lot. And uh, some people f like that, and some people find that quite intolerable, and, and indeed are drawn to, I'm speaking of people with an artistic vocation, to forms of art making which are, are more uh, collaborative uh, and have uh, that, the, that the reward of, of being with people and, and uh, often very uh, passionate uh, relationships. The performing arts are, of course, all like that. Um, I have been a, a uh, Neil says he read me in high school. I mean, gray-haired people come up and tell me they read me in grammar school now, and, uh, and they say, okay. <laughs> um, I uh, have been a published writer for close to 40 years now, and, and I wasn't um, precocious, actually. I mean, my first book, uh, I was, I was uh, 30 
when I published my first book. Of course, I'd been writing before. I'd been writing since I was seven. Uh, and I had published a few things, stories and some book reviews, you know, starting in my teens. But uh, I, I think I actually started uh, to do big work, ambitious work, rather, rather late. It took me a while to get up the nerve and feel that I could do it, to have the confidence that I was doing something that I could like or I could respect or I could admire. Uh, and that was the criterion. Uh, I've written um, four novels uh, and uh, a lot of stories. There's already a collection of stories. There will soon be a, another uh, collection. Uh, a lot of essays and various non-fiction uh, prose texts. I've written plays. I've written film scripts, which I have then uh, directed. Uh, I have all this different kind of activity. And I'm here to tell you that uh, after close to 40 years of professional activity, it doesn't get any easier. In fact, it gets harder. Uh, and again, I can only speak for myself, but I can't imagine I'm the only person uh, like this. Again, it's my temperament I'm speaking from. Uh, it, unlike um, a lot of other, well, this is an artisanal solo activity writing in an age of, of machine-made uh, mass productions, but it doesn't have the the benefit of most other artisanal or handcrafted activities like uh, carpentry or bricklaying or surgery uh, in that uh, there is some kind of skill that you develop and, and some things become, I don't want to say automatic because that, that's, that's too negative, but they, they are, they're sort of in your hand, they're in your, your mind, uh, and you don't sort of sweat over the execution of each step of this of this process. Uh, somebody who performs uh, an operation, I, I mentioned surgeon, I'd go from bricklaying to surgery because after all these still are, are, are hand activities. I think someone who has performed a complex operation a hundred times is obviously uh, not experiencing the same kind of tension. I don't say one is completely relaxed, but there is a certain thing that is built up through experience uh, that makes, gives you a feeling of proficiency or mastery or whatever. This is just common sense. I, I want to say that for me, and I, I do believe this has to be true for, I'm not the only writer to feel this, but I can only speak for myself. For me, it's, uh, if, if anything, the opposite. I've, I am uh, experiencing that it is a lot harder to go on writing uh, because I'm more self-conscious uh, than ever. Uh, th that doesn't mean I, I, I believe that, you're, that you will see that reading what I do. The idea is that all, all, the, that tr that tr all those traces of self-consciousness, of course, have to be eliminated in the final version of whatever I, I write. But for me, writing is very much rewriting. Uh, I find that, I, that as I go on, I am setting the bar higher. Perhaps that's what accounts for the fact that it seems harder. Uh, the things that I would have been uh, satisfied to do uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I'm not satisfied to do now. In other words, perhaps all I'm doing is confessing to the very American idea that uh, I should improve or get better as a writer, not simply go along with a certain uh, degree of mastery or proficiency, which I may have had uh, from the beginning or at any rate early on. And I actually um, do think that I'm a better writer than I used to be. And, uh, and uh, not just because it seems harder, it is harder, but I think I, think I know more. Uh, but because I know more, then it often feels as if every sentence is a crossroads, a fork in the road at any rate. Um, uh, I'm, uh, with, with respect, obviously I mean with respect to writing as an art, with respect to writing as uh, part of that enterprise called literature. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, service writing, uh, writing devoted to information or the expression of opinion, which in which uh, uh, I don't think these sorts of scruples have to apply. And I do do a little bit of that, too, even now. If I'm at there's certain causes 
uh, that I feel I'm competent to speak and I might uh, write a short text uh, which I'm expressing some view or insight or principle or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm not, that is not difficult. If anything, that, that kind of writing, of course, is easier. But the writing that is called literature, the writing that is uh, embodied in these two novels, the last two novels, where I really feel I've been uh, entered a whole new phase as a writer, The Volcano Lover and, and In America, uh, th those are the product of an immense um, amount of, of reworking of, if you will, writing by will, uh, writing from a conscious ambition to each time I write, uh, surpass and perhaps contradict myself. All, these are very Emersonian and, and uh, also re remind me as I hear myself speaking of uh, very, very uh, American themes as uh, Whitman also comes to mind. I contradict myself very well, I contradict myself. But I don't think there's any virtue in contradicting yourself. I just discover that I start thinking something else. After I've th thought one thing for a very long time, I, it doesn't appeal to me anymore, and I just start thinking, yes, but it's also something else. Um, so for me, being a writer is uh, finding uh, a greater expressiveness, a greater eloquence, uh, more uh, inner freedom, oh, and you don't do it by directly pursuing those those goals. Obviously, you just do it by by writing, by writing and rewriting and rewriting till you you see it's better. It's better by your own standards. Your own standards, of course, have been formed by great literature, the literature of the past. You are. Um, you are not writing for posterity. Uh, uh, Joseph Brodsky used to say something like, you know, you're, ri you're writing for your predecessors, you're not writing for posterity. You're writing for uh, the people who ha whom you most admire, who are, for the most part, uh, dead. Uh, they are the, the, the great writers of the past. They set your standards, they set your idea of what literature is. It's not that you think you're on that level, but that's the standard uh, by which you measure yourself and by which you know yourself to be still struggling and, and uh, moving towards something that can always be better than it is. What I'm not doing, and then I come to the, 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 the more, perhaps more entertaining aspect of this account, uh, what I don't think I'm doing, what I don't want to do, what I don't aspire to do is to express myself. Um, uh, I don't think of writing as psychotherapy. Um, I don't write in order to express myself. I don't write in order to define myself. I don't write in order to find out who I am. I don't write in order to be, become immortal. Uh, all, all these things may sound amusing to you, but I have heard an awful lot of writers say that, and I've heard an awful lot of readers assuming that writers say that. I, uh, many, many years ago, I hope I'm not being indiscreet, but I will be if, if that's what it is. <laughs> Many years ago, uh, about more than 20, 25 years ago, I was the, in Italy and I got to know a, um, a young, youngish, I guess my age, uh, uh, um, a professor of literature in Italy whose name was Umberto Eco. Uh, he, he had not written a word of fiction. And, uh, but he was very clever and amusing. It was fun to know him. We hung out uh, together for a while, and he, he said, I'm going to write novels. And I said, oh, great. <laughs> he said, I'm going to write best-selling novels. I've figured out how to do it. <laughs> and I thought, I thought he was, it was just a case of sort of megalomania, but he had figured out how to do it. <laughs> and I said, well, how did you do that? He said, I've been reading Alexandre Dumas and Eugène Sue, you know, two great best-sellers of the 19th century. I said, and you figured it out. He said, yeah, I know exactly what has to go into a book to um, make it uh, work. And I said, well, is it so important it be a bestseller? And he said, well, it isn't that. He said, don't think it's about money. Uh, maybe in the end, since it did happen, it was about money. But this is not what he thought, and I, and I believe him. Uh, he said, it's about immortality. Because I know if the books really are bestsellers, then they'll be in libraries. And 200 years from now, somebody will be sitting in a library reading a novel by me, and that means I'm still alive. And I said, no, you won't. <laughs> no, you're not. 
I had a very uh, a, a plebeian down-to-earth idea about what it was to be alive and what it was to be dead. Uh, <laughs> And, and Echo, well, that's worked for him. Uh, he thought he was gaining immortality. Anyway, that, that writers have all sorts of fantasies about what they're doing. And, and because we live in an, um, an era which a uh, certain kind of psychobabble is very uh, uh, common and uh, people are um, told all the time to you know, develop their selves and know themselves and all the rest of it then they think that every activity which they performed has to be justified because it's a form of self-expression. Now, I'm not saying, of course, I'm not expressing myself. I mean, I have to, I have only what's inside my head and what I know, whatever wisdom I've gained. Uh, so, of course, I am limited to myself, but it's not about me, and the point is not to do that. I mean, it's, uh, I'm always, trying to get in touch with what's not me, and that's what's important, and I'm just the instrument of doing that. And I think of that what I, what I make is, as I say, it, I'm the one who makes it. I, I, don't, I don't want to say I don't understand that, uh, that, that it's not created by me, but it's not, the point is not uh, to express me or to convey something about me. These are um, unfortunate byproducts that, in fact, I am in, in some sense expressing myself because, well, you can't step over your own feet. Um, but I, be I believe very strongly that the, pr the, purpose, the purpose of great art is impersonal or transpersonal and that I am just the uh, servant or the instrument of whatever I can do that is of um, value. And if, if there would be any personal uh, aim or purpose, uh, something in this uh, difficulty that is writing, that's, that is for me alone, it certainly wouldn't be self-expression, which I think is a very trivial uh, um, goal or um, ambition. Uh, it, 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 it would be, um, hmm, hard to pronounce the words. Uh, it would be something like salvation. It's a, uh, it, uh, I think that I, uh, in some way, transcend myself through writing. I'm, not, I'm precisely not confined um, to, to, to being myself through, through writing. It's a way of being in touch with and connected with m much, much larger realities, uh, the reality of, of other people's lives and, uh, and, and what writing can do in the way of extending our capacities for sympathy. Uh, uh, and it's also about our relationship to the language of which we are, are just the um, uh, servant. So I don't do, as I say, I don't do it to express myself. I'm, I'm making something in the, in the old sense that Aristotle talked about um, art as poesis, a kind of, uh, of, of making making of an object. And if there is a motive, then it is a motive of respect. Uh, uh, there, there, I have been uh, transformed. Uh, I have been created and transformed and continue to be changed by my relationship to various arts, uh, music, uh, painting, film, uh, literature, dance. Uh, they all have a great claim on me. Literature is the one that I felt I most called on to to work in, but it's uh, also, a, a, in, a, in a way, um, an act of gratitude as much as an act of emulation, humility, uh, perhaps, much more than ambition. Uh, it comes from being a reader. I think a writer is, first of all, a reader. And uh, my deepest uh, uh, motivation for wanting to be a writer and wanting to be a good writer and wanting to be a better writer is the uh, ecstasy which I have uh, had um, as a reader. I'll stop there and see if there's someone who wants to ask a question. Thank you. Just one technical announcement. I guess it would be a technical announcement. There's going to be a handheld microphone that Marsh is going to pass around so that the questions can be recorded. That's.
You don't have to have any questions. If you want. <laughs> yes. In your life as a writer, in your career, you've engaged in a lot of huge different projects in theater, in film, in writing, and you're, you must face a, a multitude of opportunities and projects and ideas and your own awareness of, of the needs in the world, the work you engage in um, for writers and on behalf of, of causes in the world. So my question is, how do you choose at any given time what to give uh, a certain length of time to? How do you choose one project to focus on for one length of time and manage to focus on it to the exclusion of everything else that demands your attention? Well, that's a very important question. I mean, it's actually the central question uh, of a practical kind that one might ask oneself. Uh, I'm not a disciplined person. Uh, again, I have to go back to the, 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 the notion of temperament. Um, there are novelists. Iris Murdoch, the late Iris Murdoch, was supposed to have been one of these, who had a fixed writing schedule, let's say from 9 to 5, I'm making it up. Um, if she finished a novel at 3.30, and had an hour and a half left of her daily writing stint, she would start another novel. <laughs> uh, I would, I would, I would uh, break and probably not <laughs> go near, <laughs> near a, a writing task for two months. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, a, a, I'm quite undisciplined. I work very intensely, uh, sometimes 18, 20 hours a day. Uh, and then I, there are weeks that, and days and weeks that I don't write. So again, the answer I'm about to give you comes from the fact that I'm, I'm undisciplined. I, I work by ob obsession. Um, and and a, a disciplined person, a person with a schedule, lots of writers, lots and lots of writers, uh, most writers actually work on schedules. John Updike, for instance, is supposed to, I don't know. I've never been to his place, so I'm very remotely acquainted with him. But apparently he has three rooms. Uh, with three co different computers, and uh, there's one room for the fiction, one room for the nonfiction, one room for the correspondence. Uh, and he has set times that he devotes to, uh, uh, to uh, every single day, every day of his life, to those three activities. Uh, so I start by being undisciplined. And, and then I, uh, and again, I don't know why I'm quoting Oscar Wilde for the second time, who said, I can resist everything except temptation. Uh, <laughs> Uh, things just come along and grab me, and, and I find myself doing it. It's not a question of principle. I wish it were. Why did I go to Sarajevo? I had no, absolutely no connection with Sarajevo whatsoever. I'd never been there. I'd never been in Bosnia. I have no family connection with that part of the world, with the Balkans. It meant absolutely nothing to me. I happened to go along. I was invited to go along to accompany uh, the director of a humanitarian organization who was making a quick fact-finding trip. Uh, one year after the siege uh, started, and I, and I'm a bit of a daredevil, and I thought, ooh, I get to go to a war and risk my life. Okay, uh, and I went along. I mean, what the thing that turns some people off attracts me. You know, risking my life is something I have done a number of times. Um, I'm a, a bit adventurous, even at my advanced age, still. Uh, and uh, I went, and I thought, my God, this is the most amazing situation in a genocide in Europe. Um, death camps, uh, a siege, uh, the good, a good side and a bad side. How often does that come along? And I thought, well, I'm going to come back. I'm going to find work here. I'm going to do things. I'm going to come back. That oh, absolutely, completely screwed up my life for three years. I mean, apart from the danger and difficulty and, well, the toughness of life there. It was, I mean, the bullets were whizzing past your head. There was no the glass in the windows. It's a mountain town cold in the winter, uh, no running water, no, no heat, no electricity, no et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was very tough. But it was a sort of amazing experience and a great privilege to be welcomed there and be given work to do there. And uh, I didn't do it as a writer. I did it as a person. And I dropped everything. I had started in America in, in January 1993 on April 6th, 1993, I went to Sarajevo. I'd written about, well, pretty much the first two chapters of In America. 
uh, I didn't start it again, for th take it up again for three years. Now that was very irrational. Obviously I'm not gonna work in Sarajevo on my novel. I mean, that, you can imagine what it was like to live there in a sort of ditch with you know, explosions going on. War is extremely noisy. <laughs> Nonstop noise except between three and five in the morning when they are too drunk and stop firing and dropping things in the city. And um, so there, why did I do it? I don't know. I, let me, not, let me just put, try to put it in a more compact way. I think <coughs> my idea of a, uh, a human life or a good life, I'm very, I've talked about literature, I'm, I'm very, uh, very much a product of 19th century Russian literature with all that, those questions that you find in in Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Chekhov and all those writers. How, do, how does one live? How should one live? How can one live better? And I think a better life is a life in which you forget about yourself every once in a while and just throw yourself into something which can come along quite adventitiously and it's not about you and it's about doing something for other people. I think that there, if, there, if, if altruism isn't uh, honored I don't say everybody can do this, and also I don't mean you have to go to a war and risk getting yourself killed. It can be doing any kind of, of social or public work in, you, in your own com in a community, in your own block, in your own workplace. Uh, it doesn't involve anything as, as weird uh, as going halfway around the world to, to sit and get bombed with on with people you didn't know before. Uh, but I think you should that part of your life should not be about you. It should be about service. It should be about sacrifice. It should be about um, altruism. And so these things come along, and they don't, I don't think of them as causes. I mean, I guess they are, but I never talk about it like that. I just say, well, sometimes something comes along and you just want to do it. And, it, and uh, then you have to drop everything and do it, and then you don't do it for a while. And I'm not saying that what happened in Bosnia is the worst single thing that happened you know, in that time. Uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's just an accident. You meet someone who says, come here, come, come down. Look, look what's happening in this prison. Look what's happening in this shelter for battered women. Look what's happening uh, in this school. Look what's happening in this garden. Uh, my friend Alice uh, Waters has been, uh, in, in Berkeley has been uh, doing uh, food programs in um, Berkeley and Oakland high schools because she thinks that that's something she ought to do, to. Uh, teach high school kids uh, something about food that isn't processed and frozen and so on. And that's, that's something she, she wanted to because she cares about people and she cares about, about, about uh, quality of what people eat. And that's an amazing thing uh, that, that she is doing. I know, I know many, many people who have some component of service. So I really think of it as service, not causes. And I'm very... Um, devoted to the idea of not pronouncing in public opinions about things I do not have first-hand knowledge of. You know, writers are very often treated as opinion machines. And you're supposed to, if you're reasonably articulate and you do go out in the world and you're not a recluse, uh, then people are gonna ask you about everything, what you think about everything, and you're supposed to have an answer. And I think it cheapens um, what you do. I, I, of course I have opinions about lots of things, but I, I, I hope that I will continue to have the discipline only to express opinions and take part in public actions uh, where it concerns something I have an extensive, deep, first-hand knowledge, knowledge of and commitment to. Uh, and that interrupts writing, and it interrupts your life. Your writing interrupts your life. Your art inter interrupts your life. Your vocation, your passions interrupt your life. Or your life interrupts your vocation, your passions, your writing. <laughs> so um, I, I just think maybe, maybe to, again, to answer the question, and I've gone on at such length because it's the question that most interests me. It's the thing I most think about. Uh, I just think um, the, the, the formula should be more is more. <laughs> that the more, you, the more you can take in, the more you can reach out, the more activities you can uh, engage yourself in, uh, that's better. People have a tendency to close down as they get older. And it's very understandable. They have all kinds of obligations and worries and problems and, 
and a certain kind of depression, uh, 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 you know, kicks in where you just say, oh, this is my life. Is that all there is or something like that? But, you know, you, you can change. You can, uh, uh, you know, that maybe in heaven uh, n nothing changes. But here on earth, in order to become better, you have to change a lot. Uh, yeah. If I might ask you, uh, in your prologue chapter to this book, could you explain just a few words about that chapter and how you uh, establish the point of view and the multi-layer kind of concept that you seem to be expressing there? Well, the the prologue chapter, the the the, the novel in America is framed by two monologues, and I, first, I, long after I finished it, well, not not long, a while after I finished it. I thought it's really um, like a, 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 like the masks of ancient theater with the comic mask and the tragic mask. So the first, uh, the prologue chapter, what I call zero, is there's an alter ego me. It's not me. I kind of, it's a caricature of me, actually. I don't really identify with that voice. But it borrows some things from my life. Uh, and the, this, this person living at the end of the 20th century um, is, is uh, a, becomes a time traveler and suddenly drops in on a party uh, on a late December night in the city of Krakow, uh, late December 1876. And a lot of people are moving about. It's late in the evening, and there's one woman in the center that everybody seems to be paying attention to. And the voice starts speculating, uh, well, wh where am I and who, who is that and who are these people? So it, it, it was a kind of one of those ideas that work. You know, you get in the middle of the night and say, ah, I know how to begin the book. I'm going to begin it with a kind of parable, which is both um, a description of how you make up a story, uh, what, the, what imagination is, and, and the beginning of the story. I want to draw the reader in. These people are all talking about something that they're going to do, that some of them are going to do. And the other people disapprove. And what can that be? Well, it turns out, of course, it's the project of the actress giving up her career and going to America, going to America to live in a farm, to live, uh, to, to found a commune, what we would call a commune. Uh, and people think it's crazy. Why in the world would she do that? But you're not told this straight out. The, the, uh, the voice, the fly on the wall, the time traveler is eavesdropping, as it were. And even says, I don't understand how I can understand this language, the language I don't know. The language, of course, being Polish, though occasionally they drop into, um, into French, which educated people did in Slavic, uh, in Poland and in Russia at that time. Uh, they all knew French. Uh, what well, the point of it, uh, how it came to me, it came to me in a flash like everything. You know, you just, you have an idea and it comes to you in one minute and then you, there goes the next six years of your life, you know, working it out. So it came to me as, an, as just an idea, but I really liked it because I thought it's like a play. Well, actually, it's like a movie. It's almost like a movie, I think of it. And, this person is watching and thinking. So it's a parable about how you make fiction. And another, another way I thought of it is this, this voice, this, this invisible time traveler who's dropped into the party, is auditioning for the novel, the novel that you're about to read, saying, well, I wonder who that is. Maybe that's her husband. Yep, yeah, I'm sure that's her husband. And who's that child, that sort of unhappy-looking child sleeping in a chair over there. I bet that's her child. Actresses are always lousy mothers. And, you know, and then you see the stories start to build. And then on the other end, of course, is, is the Booth uh, monologue. I can't write until I find the form. Uh, there are a lot of people who um, write novels, and I think it's wonderful if you can do this. They just take their little rowboat out into the ocean and keep on rowing, and it, they, you know, they get someplace, someplace sometimes terrific. I have to know where I'm going. I have to have a plan. I have to have an idea of how many chapters there are. I have to have an idea of the structure. I have to know the story. I often I know the title. I know the first sentence. I know the last sentence. I know who I'm de the dedication. I have to have a lot of stuff, more like kind of architect plans, uh, before I, I, I'm not going to just build a kitchen and wonder where the bedroom is going and where the living room might be. And you know, I, I, I have to see it. It's, I, the volcano lover had a very specific kind of structure. This is a very different kind of structure. I would never use this structure again. It seemed the right structure for this material. You have to find the form. I have to find the form before I can begin the book. And, and, and form is form in a very literal sense, the structure. 
the way the book is organized. And it was organized as the central narrative goes over from 76, 1876, 1888, and the two framing monologues. One or two more questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm curious about the connection between Sarajevo and this book. First of all, that it's dedicated to the friends in Sarajevo. And just after you started the book, you took th three years and went to Sarajevo and come back. It seems like it probably wasn't the same book that you started out to write. So, you know, how did the, the staying in Well, Sarajevo oddly enough, it was. <laughs> it was. I, I really, the, the, my terror was that I would never, that I, that I would lose the book. But I really wanted to write the book I had thought of before I went to Sarajevo. And why do I dedicate the, the book to my friends in Sarajevo? It's just a way of ringing the Sarajevo bell and reminding people of what happened there not so long ago. But it, it, it wasn't influenced. I, I'm very slow. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm slow to process things. I, I, I'm not even ready to write about Sarajevo yet. I, um, I've recently been very ill. I've been, I've been a cancer patient again uh, after an interval of more than 20 years. And, and that's quite an interesting experience, uh, I mean, apart from the horror of it, it, which is just how different it is to be uh, a patient now than, than in the late 70s. Medicine has really changed. And the, the way in which one is a patient has really changed. And attitudes toward cancer have really changed, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, well, I, you know, I, this is something I should share with people because it's useful. Um, and I feel very evangelical about this, I, I, particularly about cancer, which for so long um, has been a very stigmatized illness and not one that, that uh, one talks about. I remember when I was a cancer patient for the first time, I have to say, <laughs> smiling, uh, the, the, I, this is not a metastasis, it's a new primary cancer. Uh, when I was a cancer patient the first time in the late 70s, and I remember running into an uh, old acquaintance of mine in an airport, and I was very, very ill then. I was supposed to be stage four. I was supposed to be dying. And I um, ran into this friend who I hadn't, I hadn't seen since I became ill, but who had heard that I was ill, and he said, how are you? And I said, well, apart from the fact that I have cancer, I'm feeling great. And I thought he was going to faint. He was so horrified by my levity and by the fact that I could just say the word because in those days, and those of you who are older uh, will remember, it was, even the word cancer was not often used. People talked about a long illness, or the big C, or she has, you know, uh, and that kind of thing. Of course, that's changed, and I'm a tiny bit responsible for that change because of a book that I wrote then, a little, little tiny book called Illness as Metaphor. And then I'm thinking, well, what about Sarajevo? What about being ill again, I, I'm, in, I'm in remission. Um, uh, these are big experiences. I, I have something to share. I'm, I'm very eager to, sh to share things that will be morally and psychologically useful to people in the form of literature, needless to say. It's not a pamphlet, it's not journalism. But am I ready yet? Could take years more. I don't know. I don't know. It has to, I have to write from a deep place. I had been thinking about actors all my life. Uh, that's what goes into in America. I couldn't write this book, if I hadn't lived a lot of my life among actors. I know many, many actors, many directors. I know more actors and directors than I do writers. And I'm very familiar with the menta that mentality, that psychology, the way they think. I'm also attracted to theater people, to performers. Um, I'm fascinated by them. And, and, uh, and I've thought about it. I've just thought about it. I don't mean in some intellectual way. I've just taken it in over many, many years so that now I when it came to write this book, I knew I could portray in real depth, complexity, three-dimensionality, a certain temperament of a certain kind of actor. And I've been told this by many of my actor friends, oh, that's, that's me, that's me, and people quite different, of course, they all think it's them. And, <laughs> and I think that's great, that's wonderful. Uh, I mean, that means that I really did it, but I, I, it has to, I think it's very important to digest these things. One, um, maybe one last? Oh, somebody over there has had to say, you, yes, yes. Oh, I think you had your hand up for a while. Somebody's coming around, somebody's coming around. Uh, against interpretation has been mentioned once tonight. And I was talking about it with a friend of mine the other day, and we were kind of trying to remember really what that book was directed at. Um, could you, could you, it, it has a rather polemical title. 
Could you sort of recall what you were doing there, and how does that look to you now today, so many years later? Well, I think you're speaking as someone who hasn't read the book or doesn't remember it, and I don't think that I should be. Yeah, well, I don't feel that I have to give sound bites uh, no, describing my work. No, I can't do that. I, can't, I cannot su sum up uh, uh, my work in a sound bite. Um, it, it, it is there to be read, and, and that's what I thought is in the book. I have read the book. Okay, but I can't sum it up. I can't, I can't tell you what I was doing. It's, I don't think that way. I, it, I wasn't doing one thing. It's a lot of different, um, different essays with different themes, different passions. Uh, I, I think it's kind of clear if you read it. Uh, if you if you care to read it, what it was about. It's it's early work. I wouldn't do that now, but I think most of it's quite good. Uh, yes. You mentioned about the um, women's architects conference held in Japan. Yes. Could you tell me a little bit on how do you associate with the architects? How, how do I associate it, with? I mean, how? What's your interest in architects? What my interest in architects? I don't know how to answer that question. I'm interested in everything. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in Japan. I'm interested in architects. I'm interested in women who are uh, accomplished professionally. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to a conference of architects in Japan in a city called Gifu uh, to address to give the opening address, and I. I've been thinking about, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I, I must seem very inarticulate to you, but I don't know how to explain what it means just to be interested in things. I mean, I look at buildings and I read books and, and you know, wherever I go, I'm just looking. I have hungry eyes. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much.